Dear GC Get audience, I am Dr. Berza Şen Yılmaz from Turkey. In this webinar, we will focus on the diagnosis and treatment guidelines for class 3 malocclusion. Class 3 malocclusion, part 1. The class 3 malocclusion is easy to identify. However, there are cases which are far being straightforward. The treatment of class 3 malocclusion cases might be challenging sometimes. We all born free, naked and class 2. Our faces grow and develop depending on various factors. In this webinar, we are going to have a quick overview on the classification, talk about the treatment modalities for different cases. In 1899, Dr. Edward Engel was the first to classify malocclusions into class 1, class 2, and class 3 based on the relationship of the first molars. However, this classification reveals only dental information and the jaw's relationship was neglected. With the invention of cephalostats by Hofrat and Broadband, Cephalometric measurements gained major importance and the profile linear and angular parameters could be evaluated. In 1950, Engel's classification numbers were extended to refer the skeletal jaw relationship by Sazman using the term skeletal malocclusion. Sazman was the first to classify the underlying skeletal problems causing malocclusions. He classified skeletal problems into three categories and the skeletal class 3 was defined as overgrowth of the mandible with obtuse mandibular angle. Class 3 malocclusion was related to mandibular prognathia till 60s. In 1966, Tweet classified class 3 malocclusion into two categories. Category A was defined as a pseudo class 3 malocclusion, and category B was defined as a skeletal class 3 malocclusion with a large mandible or an underdeveloped maxilla. In 80s, various researchers evaluated the skeletal pattern of patients presenting class 3 malocclusion. They all reported that this malocclusion was not only related to mandible. Moyers classified malocclusions according to their osseous, muscular or dental origin. Moyers also emphasized that a pseudoclass 3 malocclusion is a positional malrelationship with an acquired neuromuscular reflex. Today, we all know that in most of the cases, the class 3 malocclusion has a maxillary component too. There are a bunch of studies about the prevalence of class 3 malocclusion. The statistics reveal certain differences among various ethnic groups. In Asia, for instance, the prevalence is higher compared to the rest of the world. In the Mediterranean region and the Middle Eastern countries, the percentage is about 10. In Turkey, its prevalence is a bit higher, around 12%, most probably thanks to of our Asian ancestors. In the first part of this webinar, we made an introduction to class 3 malocclusion and talked about the prevalence. Class 3 malocclusion part 2 before talking about the classification of the class 3 malocclusions, it should be noted that the term early treatment is often used in the literature. 
However, early means somehow done before the usual or expected time. This is the reason why I don't prefer using that term. In the book edited by Dr. Nanda, the term developing is used for growing patients by Dr. Negan and Sung. I personally prefer using the term Treatment of Developing Classroom Occlusion. Let's start to talk about the classification of classroom occlusion. We can subdivide the classroom occlusion into two types based on the clinical examination findings, true and pseudo class 3. The true class 3s often have genetic basis. On the other hand, the pseudo class 3s develop because of the habitual forward positioning of the mandible. To adequately treat the malocclusions, of course, we should first identify the cause. If left untreated, the pseudoclast trees may lead to true class tree formation since the morphology adapts to function. We can grind, correct the occlusion, correct the incisor guidance, or ask for an ENT doctor consultation to treat the pseudoclast trees. When to start the treatment? As soon as, as possible, since the habit may lead the morphology to change. As Moyer says, a pseudoclast tree malocclusion is a positional malrelationship with an acquired neuromuscular reflex. So, the position of the mandible should be caref carefully checked. If the patient can bring the mandible backward, that might be a sign of a functional shift. Let's start with an easy case. The patient underwent tonsillectomy when he was 5 years old. He had symmetrical face and the lips were competent. He had normal smile line even though the teeth alignment was not pleasant. He had balanced profile and, according to the cephalometric measurements, he had class 1 skeletal relationship, low angle growth pattern, retroclined upper incisors, normally positioned lower incisors, and the interincisal angle was increased. He had anterior and posterior crossbite and crowding. He also showed functional midline shift. He had class 2 molar relationship on the right and class 3 molar relationship on the left sides. All his teeth were present. The bottom excess was in favor of the upper teeth. To summarize, he had low angle growth pattern. His upper teeth were retroclined and he had maxillary transverse deficiency. What we needed to do? We need to correct the incisor's inclination and the transverse relationship. Considering all the clinical data, we concluded that the patient had balanced profile. We defined the main aim of the treatment, correction of the incisor's inclination. What we did was very simple. We only charged the patient a NRME treatment and fabricated an acrylic cap type expansion appliance. His midline shift corrected itself. We also opened a window on the acrylic at the level of the primary canines and placed bilateral push coils. We finished the total treatment in 5 months. This is him at the end of the active treatment. These are the follow-up records. He grew, but his profile is much better because we provided upper lip support 
and he grew in a favorable way. This is him three and a half years later. Look at the upper left lateral coming from the palate. It needed talk, but we could not detail the finishing. Look at the same lateral two years later. It uprighted because of the occlusal forces. Very good side effect. But this is how the teeth move with the retainer sometimes in an undesirable way. It is time to remove the retainer wire and start the fixed treatment to torque the upper incisors. He is now a candidate for a short-term treatment. But of course, first, he needs to improve his oral hygiene maintenance. Another case. This case was published on the cover of a Canadian orthodontic journal. The patient was presenting severe asymmetry. Look at the lip sides. The cause is of course the bilateral supraocluding primary lower canines. She has one side class 2 and one side class 3 occlusion because she is shifting. We grinded the canine tips. We expanded with a removable appliance, but the amount of expansion was not enough, so we fabricated a second appliance. The second appliance was sufficient, but she was occluding everywhere. As we all know, occlusion is the key for stability. An appliance was necessary to wait for the myofunctional adaptation and to settle a better occlusion on the right side. An appliance allowing the lower right teeth to erupt and preserving the occlusion on the left was fabricated. The bite registration was taken in a similar way with a removable functional appliance. This is the occlusion after settling. Her asymmetry was not completely corrected, but at least relieved to a certain extent. This is her face before and after. Once again, before and after. And the midline shift, before and after. In the second part of this webinar, we overview the classification of the class 3 malocclusion. We revise the treatment options for pseudo class 3s. Finally, we can summarize that elimination of the prematurities, expansion, waiting for the muscular adaptation, and achieving occlusal stability would be the main goals for the pseudo class 3 treatment. What about the three class 3s? This is the topic of the next part. Thank you for your attention. Class 3 Malocclusion, Part 3 In this part of the webinar, we will discuss about the treatment modalities related to three class 3s. One should remember that there is always underlying skeletal imbalance when three class 3 is mentioned. We all know that class 3 malocclusion can be a result of pure mandibular prognathism or maxillary hypoplasia and the combination of the two situations. Let's see first how to diagnose the maxillary deficiency. The diagnosis of maxillary retrognathia can be made with clinical examination photographic records or radiological analysis. The shelf of the white of the eye under the iris at the rest posture, deep nasolabial sulcus, and the flat cheek line are some known characteristics related to maxillary retrognathia. The decreased SNA angle 
the negative McNamara A point value and the decreased maxillary depth are some of the parameters indicating maxillary retrognathia. Let's discuss the features of the mandibular overgrowth. The clinical features of the mandibular prognathia include negative overjet, Habsburg lip, concave profile, large and strong lower jaw, and elongated chin. How to treat class 3s? I suggest you further reading in this book. In growing patients, you can apply orthopedic treatment or fixed orthodontic appliances. If you think that the case has severe skeletal discrepancy, you can postpone the treatment to be started when the growth is over. In adults, you can perform camouflage therapy or propose orthognotic surgery options. As a summary, we can state three treatment options for the three class trees. Orthopedic treatment for growing patients, camouflage therapy with fixed orthodontics, or surgery orthodontics combination therapy. Since the face mask is the most often used orthopedic appliance in the treatment of class 3 malocclusion, a special emphasis will be attributed to this appliance. In 1866, Kingsley suggested the concept of maxillary protraction. In 1875, Potspashing used the first face mask. In 1944, Oppenheim used elastics attached on a modified chin cap. The types of the face mask gained variety with time. Expansion before face mask use have been proven to provide more effective protraction. Even though there are conflicting studies in this field, the RME procedure before protraction is thought to simulate the circummaxillary sutures. Who can benefit from the orthopedic treatment? To be able to answer this question, we should overview various aspects concerning the malocclusion. First of all, the class 3 should be related to maxillary retrognathia only. We all know that we cannot stop the mandibular growth, but we can change its direction. If the class 3 is related to maxilla instead, we can try to stimulate the maxillary growth and provide basis for a favorable bimaxillary relationship. The ages for face mask varies between 4 and 15 years old in the literature. Bajetti et al. demonstrated that there is forward displacement of the maxillary complex in the early treatment group and there are significant changes in the pterico-maxillary suture area. On the other hand, no significant maxillary modifications is found in the late treatment group. Capust et al. compared patients in three age groups treated with face mask and the greater changes twice compared to the oldest group were recorded for the four to seven years old cases. Again, faster results with fewer hours of appliance per per day were obtained in the younger children groups. According to another study, the skeletal effects in young females are provided when protraction is applied before or during acceleration of the pubertal growth spurt. Kim et al. concluded that face mask therapy is effective, but to a lesser degree, in patients who are older than 10. We can assume that the age limit for girls is around 10 and 11 for boys. 
there is no lower limit reported in the literature. But the first growth spurt occurs around 4 to 5 and before 4 you don't really see class 3 cases. The exception is of course being the syndromes. The growth is another decisive factor. It is better to start with normal to low angle growing patients. Since the face mask directs mandible clockwise, and increases the lower facial height. If the bite is deep, it is better because the occlusal plane rotates counterclockwise and the bite tends to open. We can change the point of force application or change the elastic effects. The upper incisors procline and the lower incisors retrocline with the chin pad. We are on the safe side with initially retroclined upper and proclined lower incisors. Of course, the cooperation is crucial. Without the patient's help, there are no miracles. To decrease the dental effects, it is advised to instruct the patients to wear their appliances 14 to 16 hours a day. To evaluate quantitatively the cooperation, you can monitor the appliance wear with microsensors or just rely on the patient's story. Here is an example of maxillary protraction. All the class 3 believe that their mandible is prognatic. They don't diagnose the maxillary retrognathia. He had symmetrical face with competent lips. Normal to low smiling line. He had straight profile. All the teeth were present. According to cephalometric tracings, he had class 3 scattered relationship related to maxilla, low angle growth pattern and proclined lower incisors. The face mask was the solution for this case to correct the dental and skeletal problems. Anterior point of force application and the 20 to 30 degree of elastic inclination with the occlusal plane are the keys to control the counterclockwise rotation of the occlusal plane. Here are the intraoral records 6 months following the face mask and 3 months usage of bionator. In the third part of this webinar, we discussed about the treatment of class 3 malocclusion in growing patients. Class 3 malocclusion, part Four. In the last part of this webinar, we will discuss about the camouflage treatment. The pre-surgical orthodontics and the orthognatic surgery part is discussed in another webinar. So, we will only overview the fixed orthodontic treatment in class 3 malocclusion cases. In compensation cases, you can either extract or not. You would better not extract from upper dentition if possible. If you have to extract from lower dentition, you need to check the lower incisors inclination. These are the crucial keys. Here is a compensation case without extraction. Very easy. Class 3 elastics use only. This is the finishing occlusion. Not perfect, but acceptable. This is her after treatment, before and after. She matured and lost some weight. Not perfect, but the final occlusion is acceptable.
Two years later, Mother Nature had me and everything fell perfectly in place. She lost her upper retainer, but she had no diastema. Another case. She had symmetrical face and competent lip closure. She had normal smiling line and straight profile. All the teeth were present. According to her cephalometric measurements, she had class 1 relationship and vertical growth pattern. We opened the missing space for the right upper canine and work with an overriding night eye wire. We aligned and finished the case. Unfortunately, she had to move abroad before we could detail finishing. The upper lip is better supported and the nasolabial angle decreased. The lower incisor's angle is maintained. The upper lip is closer to the E line and the nasolabial angle decreased. Here is another camouflage case. The patient had symmetrical, asymmetrical face and incompetent lips. She had normal smiling line and straight profile. The upper midline was on with the face, but the lower one was shifted 2 mm to the left. She had class 3 molar and canine relationship on the right and on the left sides. All her teeth were present. She had slight crowding on both arches. According to Seth analysis, she had class 3 skeletal relationship, high angle growth pattern, and retroclined incisors. Nasolabial angle was increased and the upper lip was retruded according to the Ricketts E line. We started with the lower third molars extraction, and here is the course of the treatment. After leveling, we cemented the carrier motion appliance and we gave force 1 intermaxillary elastics. These are the changes after the first month. Second month. This stage is frightening at first sight, but it happens with all the cases. Nothing to worry about. We started living in the lower arch too and we raised the bite. We leveled and finished the case. The treatment lasted 25 months. These are the panoramics. The roots are okay. The skeletal measurements didn't change a lot. The upper incisors proclined and the impa increased. The nasolabial angle decreased. How was the case corrected? The upper molars extruded, the lower molars intruded, and the lower incisors extruded. The occlusal plane rotated counterclockwise. How could we have better finished the case? We could have intruded the lower posterior teeth a little bit more with the help of, help of a screw. And extrude the upper incisors a little bit more 
to better follow the lip curvature. But she was overall happy with the treatment results. This is her one and a half years later. She preserved nice changes in her smile. The bite decreased a little bit, but the occlusion is still acceptable. Here are the profile pictures, before and after the treatment, and with one and a half year follow-up. and the intraoral records. In the next part, we will try to define how to decide which patients are candidate for surgery. Class 3 malocclusion, part 4. The pre-surgical orthodontics and the orthognotic surgery part is discussed in another webinar. However, we will rapidly discuss how to decide whether the patient is candidate for surgery or not. Who is candidate for surgery and when is the ideal time to do it? Several investigators have attempted to predict the progression of the class 3 malocclusion. I will show you one of the most popular methods the one proposed by a class 3 guru, Peter Negan. According to Dr. Negan, the, in the early mixed dentition, once the patient is diagnosed with maxillary deficiency, the patient should be treated with maxillary expansion and a protraction face mask to eliminate the CO-CR discrepancy and to maximize the nasomaxillary complex growth. The patient is followed for 3 to 4 years. A GTRV analysis will then be performed during the early permanent dentition to allow clinicians to decide whether the malocclusion can be camouflaged by orthodontic treatment or whether a surgical intervention is necessary. For performing a GTRV, we need two cephalometric radiographs. First ceph is taken at the end of the face mask treatment, and the second ceph is taken three to four years after, in the early permanent dentition period. Maxillary and mandibular horizontal skeletal changes are recorded on the superimposed cephs with projections on the occlusal plane. The horizontal growth changes of the maxilla and the mandible between the post-treatment radiograph and the follow-up radiograph are set in the GTRV formula. Class 3 patients with a GTRV ratio that falls below 0.38 should be warned about the future need for orthognotic surgery. For cases coming for treatment in the permanent dentition stage, other factors are considered by different researchers, such as the lower incisor's inclination, holdaway angle, or the cranial base angle. It has also been reported that the vertical craniofacial growth is an unfavorable sign of the prognosis of class 3 malocclusion in the deciduous dentition. Which appraisal is also considered as a decisive parameter. Skeletal class 3 malocclusion exhibits thinner alveolus around the mandibular incisor apices. It is crucial to evaluate the alveolar bone thickness of adult skeletal class 3 patients in mandibular anterior region to be able to decide whether the anterior teeth may be retroclined for compensation or not. As a summary, the surgery decision is multifactorial. Let's see an example 
of what we can do for a patient candidate to orthognathic surgery. All cephalometric data, the clinical examination, and the family history indicated the need for surgery. So, we decided to wait for the growth to be over. However, the patient was really unhappy with his smile. He was complaining about the crowding. We decided to level the upper arch only as a first part of the treatment to provide him a better smile aesthetic till the growth is over. We planned extraction of the upper first bicuspids and left the canines to drift to dontics. We leveled the upper arch and finished the treatment. He had much better smile aesthetic even though the skeletal discrepancy was more obvious. This is him before and after. To conclude, it is important to note that habitual forward positioning of the mandible should be corrected as soon as possible. Protraction of the maxilla is effective in patients younger than 11 presenting maxillary retrognathia. In the permanent dentition, you can either compensate the skeletal malocclusion, correct the crowding and wait for the surgery or just wait for the surgery. The camouflage treatment decision is multifactorial lower incisors inclination and the supporting tissues should be considered. Thank you for your attention.